Good morning, New Life. You guys want to stand up and join us for worship today? That would be wonderful. Start in the right key, though. Today, 
uh, just praising Jesus here for who he is and looking, praising God for who he is. We are singing to the creator, right? We are encouraging each other to sing to the creator today. Isn't that an awesome privilege that we have here today? That, that the, the noises that we make, right, please our father. Uh, what a beautiful thing that is. Let's just remember that as we praise him here today.
You are great. You are Lord above all lords, Lord of all nations. God, and someday we will all bow before you. And yet, God, you are this high God, this God far above us, and you are also a God that is close to us, Lord, that is near us, God, that knows every aspect of our life, God, that knows every intimate detail, who dances over us, God. And we thank you for that. by your love, God. Thank you, Lord, that, you're, that we can never answer the question as to how wide and, you're, you're, and how deep your love is for us. It is infinite. We will spend all of eternity trying to understand that, God, and we'll never reach the end of it, God. You are infinite, God. We just praise you for that. We praise you, God, that you are infinitely great and infinitely intimate with us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for that. Amen. Thank you guys for uh, worshiping with us. You guys can go ahead and uh, have a seat and greet somebody nearby.
Good morning, New Life. Thanks for joining us this morning, both here in the sanctuary and also virtually on the internet. We're glad to have you. Um, this is the time when we do our, our communion meditation. Uh, you know, <laughs> when Angie and I bought our first house, uh, it was a fixer-upper in Coralville, it, uh, it needed, among other things, uh, new carpeting in the living and in the dining areas. We didn't have the money to replace it right then, so we gave it a good cleaning and we put up with it for a couple of, of years until we could afford new. Well, that carpet was like everything else in the world. It was replaceable. And when we were ready, we simply ripped it up, we rolled it up, and we hauled it to the dump. And so our life is spent churning through things, things that God has given us for our pleasure and for our convenience. But if we're not careful, however, those things that he created can become more important than the creator himself. Read the text. It's from Hebrews chapter 1, verses 10 through 12, although the author of Hebrews is actually quoting from Psalms 102. But beginning with verse 10, he also says, refers to God the Father. The rest of the verses apply to God the Son. He also says, In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment. They will be changed. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. Yet all that we have and that we hold dear in this life was made for us by Jesus. That he will roll them up like a robe tells us that even the best things in life, marriage and family, a safe and loving home, a big retirement account, a secure job, those things are not indestructible. In fact, they are quite temporary. Only Jesus Christ is permanent. Only what is done for him will last for eternity. With each service here at New Life, we pause to enjoy communion and remember his sacrifice on the cross for us so that we could have a forgiveness of sin and eternal life. It reminds us not to give higher status to earthly resources than to things eternal. Now, if you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, please pause with us at this time to participate in communion. Also, prayer requests will appear for our church shortly. Now, if you don't know Jesus, then please take time this morning to find out how you can have a relationship with him.
All right. Well, I too want to welcome you to New Life Community Church. Good to see you guys here this morning. Want to first highlight several announcements that are in the bulletin and then update you on some families in our church that have experienced some sorrow here in the past week. Uh, first for the, the bulletin announcements. So uh, today, men, is the last day for you to register to participate in the men's retreat that is next weekend. So if you have not had a chance to sign up yet, uh, you'll notice in the bulletin today that there's an insert with an agenda about what will be taking place next Friday evening and Saturday and the uh, website address that you can use to get registered. Again, today's the last day to do that, guys, so please take care of that. Uh, also, <clears throat> we continue this week to offer you an opportunity to stop at the Welcome Center and pick up a baby bottle that is uh, part of an annual fundraising activity for Bridgehaven Support Services here in Cedar Rapids. I'll be sitting out there um, between services, so if you want to stop by and pick up a bottle or just ask some questions about Bridgehaven, I'd be happy to do my best to answer those for you. Finally, we've been advertising throughout the month here to uh, have you sign up for ministry opportunities that would begin on July 1st in the next ministry year. We want to continue to encourage you to do that today. Uh, Brenda tells us that we have not had very many people um, hit the link yet to do that. So again, the, the, um, the ask there is that if you're already participating in some ministries and you want to continue that next year, that you would reaffirm that by going out to the website and letting us know. And if there's some new things that you'd like to hop into, uh, that would be your opportunity to express your interest in that as well. Okay, um, a few family announcements here. Uh, some of these uh, you guys are probably aware of, and others just you may have missed as some emails went out over the week, but uh, we want to acknowledge a couple of people that have um, passed away here recently. Yesterday, uh, Annie Mullinex, there was a visitation for her here in town. Annie was the mom of Blade Mullinex and Nicole Sanders, and she passed away a couple of weeks ago. And then this past week, of course, um, Troy uh, and Tiffany lost their mom, Sandy, uh, and she had been sick for some time. Speaking with Troy yesterday, you know, that's a, a, an example of how we sort of anticipate a person's passing away and there's some sorrow there, but for a believer, there's also some joy when that occurs and even some relief. So we just want to acknowledge with both of those families that we're praying for you and um, hoping that... The next few days and weeks will will bring some joy amid some of that sorrow. Yesterday, we got uh, the news that our brother Tim Calcara passed away. Uh, you may not know Tim personally. He is the dad and uh, father-in-law of Brett and Megan Calcara, uh, Dax's grandfather. Tim has been here at New Life a number of times worshiping with us on Sunday mornings. And uh, Tim uh, is one of those that... Uh, contracted COVID about a month or a month and a half ago and just never really recovered from that. So he passed away uh, last night. And then finally, uh, Trudy Mitchell is uh, at Mercy Hospital now. She has been uh, released from uh, all of the equipment that uh, has been keeping her alive for the last couple of days. And uh, really it's a matter of time before she passes away. We expected that might happen yesterday. It didn't. Uh, Trudy made it through the evening, but uh, Angela and Hannah, her daughter and granddaughter, uh, have been there constantly and are uh, just waiting for, for Trudy to pass. So please keep that family in your prayers as well, and I'm sure we'll have some more updates here in the near future. We rejoice with those who rejoice. Uh, for those that are having weddings and having babies and all those fun things, but we also uh, cry and remember with those people who have sorrow. So we wanted to point those things out this morning. Kurt? I had the privilege of being present yesterday at both times when they removed the ventilator from Trudy and from Tim. And it was just a reminder of the great, great gift that Jesus Christ has given us in eternal life. We will never die. But death is still ugly and uh, death is still real. And, uh, but we're just, uh, it just reminded me of the wonderful gift that we have in Christ through believing in Him. We have eternal life. In 2 Samuel chapter 16 and 17, we are getting an explanation of some things in David's later life. And uh, it's after his sin with Bathsheba. And quite frankly, David's life starts falling apart. 
in many ways. His son Absalom rebels against him and wants to kill him. And therefore, David flees from Jerusalem out of the palace with his whole family and his friends. And uh, he finds himself in the desert, actually, the wilderness area there, just outside, just west of, uh, or just east of Jerusalem there. And this was a low point in David's life. Uh, he had spent 16 years in the desert before he became king. And now he was back in the desert after becoming king. And it was during this time that David wrote Psalm 63. A Psalm of David when he was in the desert of Judah is the heading of Psalm 63. And he was facing, as he says, those who want to kill me and the mouths of liars who were slandering him. He had lost his throne, abandoned his home, and left his friends. And his life and family were in danger. As David traveled through the desert after losing so many things, he wrote this prayer to God. O oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. David's experience of losing everything and having to live in the desert helped him remember something that he had written in another psalm, Psalm 70. But as for me, I am poor and I'm needy. This is a hard thing for humans to admit. We have so much abundance around us. We have money. We have homes. We have food and water and people who love us. We seem to have everything we need. You would think we would believe that, that we have everything we need, and yet we still struggle with feeling discontent and still feel like we're needy. David expressed a solution to all of this later in Psalm 63. He said, your unfailing love, Lord, is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. You, God, satisfy me more than the richest feast. David knew that it was only his relationship with God that could truly meet his deepest needs. And that's one of the hardest lessons to learn, even as a Christian. And Jesus reminds us of this very thing in the Lord's Prayer. We have come to that famous request in Matthew chapter 6, verse 11, Give us today our daily bread. In an earlier message, we asked this important question, Why does Jesus want us to pray for things that God has already promised to give us? Does anyone here think that they're going to starve to death tomorrow if they don't pray for their daily bread today? I don't think so. Why, then, do we need to pray a prayer like this? Well, first, because God wants us to be reminded that we are poor and needy apart from Him. Secondly, to be reminded that all of our needs are ultimately met by God, that everything comes from Him, even our daily bread. But thirdly, because Jesus is referring to deeper needs than just bread. By encouraging us to pray for, bet, for bread, he is reminding us of the very basic needs of our life. New Testament scholar John Stott summarizes part of the Lord's Prayer by saying, quote, is an expression of ultimate dependence on God. Jesus wanted his followers to be conscious of a day-to-day -day dependence. And again, that's one of the most difficult but most important things about being a Christian is to learn that. Yes, God wants to fill us and satisfy us. He wants us to live a satisfying, fulfilling life. But we must first admit that we need Him. We must first admit and recognize my primary point today. God created you with great needs, Christian, that only He can completely fulfill have you ever seen how desperately dependent a newborn baby is out of the womb? <laughs> they are gasping for their first breath. A short time later, they are sucking their first food. And during the first few minutes of birth, they are really so very close to death because they are so needy and completely dependent. In many ways, a baby is just a bundle of needs. But Christians, so are we. I want you to remember that baby. Because that's how God sees us. You know, unfortunately, as we grow older and stronger, we forget how desperately dependent we are. Now, breathing seems normal. We feed ourselves and provide for all of our own needs. We're not that baby anymore. 
And so we can easily become convinced that we are this self-sufficient person. And quite frankly, there's parts of us that become convinced we don't even need God. The truth is, apart from God, we are nothing but a bundle of needs, like that baby. When Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing, he meant it. You cannot be saved apart from faith in Christ. You cannot do anything spiritual, loving, or holy, or God-glorifying apart from the power of Christ. You cannot even live today without Christ giving you one more breath. But we still want to believe we are independent and self-sufficient. And again, one of the hardest and most important things that we could ever learn is how to rely on God. The devil, uh, our own sinful nature, our culture that we live in all work to convince us that we do not need God. In fact, the essence of all sin is independence from God. That's what sin is. That is very core. It's trying to be independent from God. Before Adam and Eve sinned, they enjoyed a complete and constant and conscious dependence on God. When they sinned, they lost this and for the first time experienced a separation from God. And the primary goal of the Christian life is to regain that. What Adam and Eve lost that complete and constant and conscious every moment of the day dependence on God. Our sinful nature hates to depend on others, even God. But the truly strongest people you will ever know are those who have learned to depend on God the most. But that strength of relying on God does not come easily. The Apostle Paul writes of his own painful lesson in relying on God. He writes in 2 Corinthians, We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. And really, that's what has to happen for us to say, oh, maybe I need God. (laughs) And we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. But as a result... We stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God. That's a good place to be. It's a hard thing to get there, but that's a good place to be. But even after 20 years of following Christ, the Apostle Paul was still learning how to rely only on God. And like anyone else, this can only happen when we experience great loss and difficulties and pain that are beyond what we can endure. I wish we could get there easier. We just don't learn this very well. Because only then do you realize the truth of how much you need God. This is what David was experiencing in that desert. Again, he had lost a lot of things at this point in his life, and he was fleeing in the desert. He cries out to God, Oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. David was experiencing what Paul experienced in Asia, recognition of his needs, that God created us with great needs. You know, we have a physical need for oxygen, water and food. And if we do not have these things, we are gasping for air, we're thirsty for water, and, are, and we're craving food, or else we eventually die without those things. Humans easily recognize that they have these physical needs, but many do not recognize their great emotional needs. We need to feel secure. We need to feel significant. We need to feel accepted. These God-given emotional needs can be summed up in God's, in this one God-given desire that God has created us with, and that's the desire to be happy. God created your heart. Listen, God created your heart with one ultimate driving desire. It's to be happy. Which is why everything you do, if you'll think about this, everything you do, every decision you make, is ultimately motivated in some way to make you happy. And there's nothing wrong with that. Because it is God himself who programmed your heart to seek happiness. 
because you only <clears throat> truly find it when you find him. <clears throat> seeking true happiness and seeking God are not two different things. As Christians, we know they are the same thing. There is no happiness without God. No such thing. God is programmed into the center of every human heart, the desire and drive to be happy. And again, this is what everyone seeks in everything they do. Everything. Unfortunately, it is our desire to be happy that's also the ultimate reason we sin. You become convinced that disobeying God in some way will give you the most pleasure, the most significance, the most acceptance, and the most security. And you disobey God to be happy. When in reality, the only way to be happy ever is to trust and obey Him. Some time ago, I created an acronym that I believe sums up our greatest emotional needs. Some of I've taught this before. The acronym is HAPPIER. How do you become happier? By fulfilling these God-given emotional needs in your life to have hope, approval, protection, power, importance, enjoyment, and relationship. These are what I call the happier needs. God created you to desperately need these emotional blessings in your life. You need them as much as your physical needs. It is easy to recognize that if you do not have food and water and air, you will die. But you also need to recognize that if you do not have your emotional needs satisfied, you will want to die. And you might even kill yourself. For example, consider the first emotional need, hope. It is being confident that your deep desires will be fulfilled. If you become convinced that your greatest needs and desires will never be met, Life may not seem like it's worth living. If you lose all hope, and this is why having no hope leads people to suicide. Therefore, the opposites of hope are feeling hopeless and even wanting to die. <clears throat> and it's the absence of hope that helps us to recognize how desperately we need hope in our lives. Approval is a deep and fundamental emotional need for humans that God gave us. It is being accepted in a favorable way. By others. The opposites of approval are rejection, condemnation, and shame. And our God given need for approval is demonstrated by all the things we do to feel accepted and approved by other people and by how painful it is to be rejected and condemned or exposed in a shameful way. Approval is a great human emotional need. Protection is the God given need of being secure from harm. Its opposites are feeling vulnerable, in danger, and unsafe. Again, how many things do people do every day just to feel safe? We need to feel protected. Power is the God-given need of being free and able to do what you want to do. Its opposites are feeling trapped, stuck, overwhelmed, enslaved, inadequate, and powerless. Those are painful emotions. Why? Why? Because God created us with a need to need power of some sort that we can have some freedom to do what we want to do. It's a need. Importance is one of the most fundamental emotional human needs. It is the God-given need of being valuable and useful and having a purpose. While all humans deeply desire this, men experience importance more through being respected and women through being cherished. And the opposites of feeling important are feeling worthless and insignificant and not needed by anyone. It is possible that almost everything we do is an attempt to feel like we matter and for others to think we matter too. We desperately want to matter. Enjoyment is the God-given need of experiencing pleasure. Some may think this is a sinful desire, but God created you with the need for enjoyment. And your need for it is again demonstrated by how many things you seek to experience pleasure and how much you do to avoid the opposites of pain and boredom and depression. We hate all those things. But again, <clears throat> here's the difference. When we seek our pleasure and our enjoyment in God, it becomes a fulfilling thing. When we try to seek that pleasure and enjoyment in sinful ways, it becomes empty. It really matters how we try to seek to fulfill these needs. 
But we need to recognize we have them. Relationship, finally, is the God-given need of being with another person. <clears throat> its opposites are feeling alone and separated. And again, your need for it is evident by how much you crave relationships and how painful it is when we lose them. Because our God-given need for relationship, isolation is devastating to humans. This is why solitary confinement is considered one of the cruelest punishments. These happier needs can be summed up in our need for security, significance, and satisfaction. The acronym HAPPIER reminds us of a very simple but fundamental truth. Happiness is having your needs fulfilled. That's what it is. When you have reason to hope, have the approval of others, feel protected from harm, have the freedom and ability to do what you want, feel important and useful, enjoy your life, and are experiencing relationships, then you'll be happy. And God wants to provide you with all those things. This is why joy is the unconditional happiness that comes from having our needs met by God. You see, you can try to get these needs met by the world or by other people. And your happiness will go up and down based on what's happening in your life. But if you can find the secret to getting your needs fulfilled in your relationship with Christ, you can have his unconditional joy. The love of people can certainly be a blessing to us, but both scripture and experience teaches us that no human can fully satisfy the emotional needs that God has created us with. Only he can completely satisfy us in these emotional needs. When you try to get your happy, happier needs satisfied by possessions or people, you experience the disappointment and the pain that comes from idolatry, because that's what idolatry is, is trying to worship, trying to get our needs met by something or something other than God. One of the most difficult but vital convictions of a mature Christian is that none of my God-given emotional needs can be completely satisfied by people. But my deepest needs can only be satisfied by faith in the promises and experience of God. This is why Jesus wants us to pray for our daily bread. To help us recognize that God created you with great needs that only He can completely fulfill. And praying to God for our daily needs, we are admitting to God that we have needs. Like David, who in Psalm 70 admitted, But as for me, I am poor and needy. Many Christians have a very difficult time admitting this, even to God. Some have thought that possessions or people were the only way to be happy. Others have grown up in families where some or all of their emotional happier needs were completely absent. They didn't have anybody to really love them. And because of all the disappointment and pain they have experienced, it's become less painful to simply believe they do not need these things. <laughs> have you ever been there? To simply believe that you do not need these things. Have you ever known someone like that? That they will not even admit that they have these happier needs. And they can't admit that because they have no confidence these needs will be met. And that's what life has taught them. Just do without. Just live with those parts of your heart that are empty. But friend... God created you with these needs. Listen, God created you with these needs so that you would need him, so that you would seek him. After you've been disappointed by all the people and all the possessions and everything else this world can offer you, after you've been disappointed with all of that, his hope is that you'll finally seek him for your companionship, for your security, for your significance, for everything you need. God does not want you to deny that you have these needs, but to grow in your faith and experience in relationship with him so that they are fully satisfied in him like they were with Adam and Eve in the very beginning. One of the ways that we recognize these needs in our life is by monitoring how often we feel their opposites. Feeling angry, worried, and depressed are usually the result of not having our happier needs fulfilled. Let me say that again. We need to monitor our emotions to know if our emotional needs are being met. If we are feeling angry, worried, depressed, discontent, that is usually because we are lacking one or more of those happier needs. And we need to seek God on that and not just live that way. Recognition of your needs and your need for God is one of the reasons God allows the difficult deserts of your life. 
As we noted above, Psalm 63 was written by David in the desert while he was losing his kingship and his home. And it was in such a desert that he recognized his needs. And he wrote again, my soul thirsts for you, God. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. That's really a description of the world. (laughs) David was reminded in the desert again, but as for me, I am poor and needy and that God created him with great needs. And as we pray to our Father, give us today our daily bread. We are reminded of our primary point that God created you with great needs that only he can completely fulfill. Well, how do we experience this? We've talked enough about the problem. David recognized his need, but he also knew God could meet them. As noted, later in Psalm 63, he said this, Your unfailing love, Lord, is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. You satisfy me more than the richest feast. You know, this is a, this man that's talking here has experienced disappointment in life. He's tried other things in this world, even being a king. How many wives did he have? Three or four? He'd eaten the finest foods the world could offer, and he understood it doesn't work. It's your unfailing love that I keep coming back to. You're the only one that can fill me. David had experienced God's unfailing love in so many ways, and he had grown to depend on that unfailing love through the difficulties of his life, and he had become convinced that God's love for him was better than anything else he could experience in this life. How do we experience that love? How can we get God's love into those hurting places, those empty places of our heart that are feeling alone or ashamed or rejected? Let us be reminded that the battle over our hearts is simply a battle between truth and lies. It's that simple. If we're feeling something other than love, joy, and peace, it is only and always because we are believing a lie about ourselves somewhere deep down inside, and those lies are controlling us, and they are causing those painful and sinful feelings. There's a part of you that's believing, I'm not safe. There's a part of you believing, I'm not important. There's a part of you believing, I am alone. Which is why Jesus said the truth would set us free from the power of sin. But it is a particular, specific truth that we need the most. And it is the truth about God's love. There's only one truth. There's a lot of truth in the Bible. I have theology books that will give you thousands of truths in the Bible. But the most important one, really the only one that you need, is God loves you. Those three words, if you believe them with all of your heart, will give you the most satisfying and happy life you can ever imagine. The Apostle Paul knew that, by the way. Listen to this prayer that he prayed for the Ephesians. He cared about the Ephesians. He wanted them to be strong and vibrant Christians. So what did he pray for them? What did he think was the key to the Ephesians Christians experiencing a happy and fulfilled and fruitful Christian life. Listen to his prayer. I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Not theology, not eschatology, not ecclesiology, not pneumatology, not all those theologies. One thing you've got to grasp is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. What does he mean by that? It's not just something in your head. It's in your heart. You've experienced it. That's what he's talking about. You haven't just read about it in the Bible. You haven't just read about it in a book. You have experienced God's love that you may be filled. Listen to the result. That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God by this one thing, grasping Christ's love for you. That's what fills us up. Our deepest needs will be fulfilled. Our deepest emotional needs will be fulfilled by that. The New Living Translation puts it this way. 
Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Do you see how powerful it is to grasp God's love for you? How do we do this? Well, David mentions a couple of things. He said, your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you, I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. You satisfy me more than the richest feast. David practiced two things, praise and prayer. That's what helped him experience God's love, even when he felt like his life was being lived in the desert. What does prayer do? Well, it makes us ready to receive God's love. Some of you here today perhaps have never tasted God's love for you. God is not personal to you. At best, he seems like this distant, far-off person who doesn't really care. And if he did notice you, that would just kind of make you afraid because he might judge you. Maybe that's where you're at with God. Friend, this is why Jesus Christ came to die on a cross. To give you a way to make God your friend. To have a way for God to forgive you of all of your sin. The Bible put it this way. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. It's that simple. We all need to stop trusting ourselves. To come to a point where we realize that our own goodness is not going to be good enough. That we needed Christ to die for our sins. To pay for them. So how does a relationship with God begin? With a prayer. A prayer admitting your need. Can you sincerely tell God, God, I need you? That's when he starts listening. That may be the very first prayer he ever listens to from your lips. God, I need you. <laughs> if you can pray that, then you can begin a relationship with God. But that prayer is also how we restart, how we as Christians restart and rekindle our relationship with God. The reason God starts feeling distant for even a Christian is that we become independent. We start relying on things or people other than him for our happiness. And then we lose touch with him. How do we get back to him? The same prayer. <laughs> Father, I need you. I was in this sanctuary just this week. And I recognized I was feeling something I shouldn't be feeling. And I came to the sanctuary and I said, Father, I need you. And that restarted something between me and him. And I was able to process that and get reconnected. That part of my heart got reconnected with him. Father, to say, Father, I am asking for my daily bread. Father, I recognize you as the ultimate source of everything I need. I am not looking to accomplishments or people to make me feel important or secure or happy. You sent your son to die for me. How could I be any more important than that? And as we start praying prayers like that, it rekindles our closeness to God. Honest prayer. The kind of prayers that David prayed in Psalms. Those kinds of prayers that we are being honest with God about how we feel. We're expressing anger and fear and all of that stuff, and we're giving it to him those kinds of prayers get the spiritual juices flowing. And if you can't do that, if you don't have that kind of relationship with God, you're stuck, my friend. You got to be able to learn how to yell at God. Listen, Paul thought that his prayers for the Ephesians could actually work to help them grasp God's love for them. And I pray this regularly for our church and the people in our church. And you've noticed on the prayer slide for a place to grow that there's a prayer request on there every month that God would help us to grasp his love for us because it's such a key, critical key, key to the Christian life. And Paul believed praying for this would help. So let us be praying it for one another and let us be praying it for our friends and our spouses and our children. The prayer that Paul prayed, that they would grasp God's love for them because that's the most important thing in their life. And pray it for yourself, that God would help you to experience his love in your life so that you can grasp more of his love for you because that's the most desperate thing that you need. Finally, David practiced praise to experience God's love for him. He said, your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you, I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. You satisfy me more than the richest feast. What did David's, how did David's? Praise for God, help him experience God's love. 
Well, David regularly thanked God for all the ways that God had already demonstrated his love for David. (laughs) When we are in the desert, when we are experiencing hard things, when we when we are not experienced, we don't feel like we're experiencing God's love. We do something really dumb. (laughs) In those very places where we need God's love, we forget about God's love. We can read about God's love in the Bible. And if you do not have a relationship with God yet, that is all you have. What he says in the Bible, you may not have experiences with them. The testimony of the Bible about what God has done to reveal his love for you is where you got to start. And that is where we all have to start. We have to start with the cross that's revealed in scripture. But as Christians, we have many other demonstrations of God's love in our life. If you will look for them, if you will recognize them. Now we can never do better than remembering the cross. We never get beyond that. The Bible says God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. We never graduate from that. That's the foundation. What God has done to prove his love for us. He sent his own son to suffer the penalty for our sins. It doesn't matter what else is happening in your life. It doesn't matter what else you want from God. It doesn't even begin to compare with what he's already done. If you will take the time to remember and praise him for that. And as we praise him for this, we're reminded of its truth and it helps to dispel these lies that we are believing and we experience God's love by thanking him for how he has already demonstrated his love to us. We can never stop praising him for the cross, which is why we do it in communion every Sunday to give us an opportunity to experience and grasp more of God's love for us because of what he did for us on the cross. But we have much more to thank God for than just the cross. We're a very blessed people. As Christians, we recognize that every good thing we have comes from God. Every good thing in our life is evidence of God's love for us. And we As we thank him for those things, we're reminded of this. What happens when we neglect praise in our life? Well, we start getting our eyes focused on what we do not have instead of what we do have. And when we do, the devil will lead us into sin. I have shared the example of Eve before. She lived in a perfect garden in a perfect body with a perfect husband and a perfect relationship with God. How could she screw that up? She had everything. The devil convinced her that she needed something that God had not given her. He said, Eve, you need the knowledge of good and evil that God has forbidden you to have. And Eve believed the lie that if she didn't have that, she'd be missing something in her happiness. And because she believed this lie about herself, And the source of her true happiness, she sinned against God and lost all of that perfection just because she believed the lie. We must be diligently praying and praising so that we can continue to experience God's love to meet our deepest needs. We need to be willing to admit those needs before God, that we have them and that we need him. And this is why Jesus wanted us to pray for our daily bread To remind us of our primary point, God did create you with great needs, and only He can completely fulfill them. I'd ask you to bow your head for a moment this morning. And I'd like us just to pray about these things for a moment, okay? I want to ask you, first of all, in your seat there, to admit your need to God. What is your need? Do you not even know Him? Do you not have a personal relationship with him? Do you need God in your life because you don't have him in your life? I'd ask you to admit that need this morning to him first. If you're a Christian, I'd ask you to admit your need. What do you need? What have you been ignoring? What have you been trying to suppress? What have you been trying to deny? Just be honest with God that you need something. I'll give you a moment to do that.
And I would ask you just to do one thing more. I'd ask you just to take a moment to praise God for two things. What are two things, two demonstrations of his love for you? Not from the Bible. I'm talking about something even beyond the cross. Things that you know that God has done for you and given to you that are demonstrations of his love. I'd ask you just to take a moment and thank him for those two things. Lord Jesus, we do come before you admitting, oh my goodness, we are poor and needy. We're like that baby that's born and without you would die. We're so close to death. We just, we forget. <laughs> we forget how desperately we need you. And we just want to be reminded, we're just, we need you, God, our creator, our friend, and we just pray the prayer, the Ephesians 3 prayers, I call it. God, would you help us to grasp the full dimensions of your love for us? Would you help every part, nook and cranny of our heart to be convinced of God's great love for us? I pray that for myself and for my friends and for our church. Work, God, draw us to yourself. We need your help to get this so that we can completely rely on you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a God week. Hope to have you here back next week. Again, in a couple weeks, Memorial Day weekend, we'll be going to one service, okay? So that'll be our first time for one service, Memorial Day weekend. Uh, please be praying for that as well.